Hello, my name is Mark, and here's an introduction to Christianity, or an overview of it, in about 45 minutes. And so, hop in and hold on. First of all, God is personal. God is not an it or a force. In the Bible, God is viewed as a person. We find God grieving, expressing definite emotions. There are three persons that comprise God. Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let me explain it this way. You have manhood. Those are all the individuals that have the characteristics of being a man. They fit in that category. The same with womanhood or childhood. When we come to the category of Godhood, things like being eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, only three individuals fit into that category, or three persons. These persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God always acts in our best interest, especially in view of His commands. There are many passages that point out that God has commanded us something for our good or for our survival. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and about verse 8, it says, He who would love life and see good days and then it tells us to not do certain things and to do certain things. So the Bible then would be pictured as our owner's manual. And God being the creator and we are the creation. And just like if you wanted your car to run really, really well, you would change the oil frequently and do everything the owner's manual said and do all the regular maintenance. That is what the Bible is like. The Bible is an owner's manual not to keep us away from fun but rather to make sure that we don't mess up the fun. God certainly wants us to enjoy life and enjoy our existence here. And he understands that there are certain things that can really complicate that and bring a lot of misery upon ourselves. So God put us together. Therefore, the Bible presents God as the one being know what will truly make us happy. And remember, happiness is a byproduct. If you go out and try to find happiness, that is, I'm going to go out and I'm going to please myself. I'm just going to go and look for pleasure or instant gratification or living for the moment. Or I'm going to do what I want to do. You'll never find happiness. Happiness is a byproduct. You'll realize, and Jesus taught this, that when Jesus talked about if you will lose your life, you'll gain it. The idea is if you will go out and serve others, and Christianity is a religion preeminently about think about the other person. Do the same thing Jesus did. Jesus gave up his glory of heaven and comfort there, and he came down here and died for us. Have the same attitude, Philippians chapter 2, about verses 3 through 6. Live the same way. Live unselfishly. Think about others. Don't think about yourself first. Jesus said if you live that way, what you'll realize that in, in the end of, in, at the end of the day, you'll realize that your needs have been taken care of, that you feel good about yourself, that you have actually found happiness. But happiness is a byproduct of doing the right thing. Also, the Bible presents God as being both the creator and the author of Scripture. Therefore, science, which is God's science, that is how this universe works. True science and true biblical interpretation will always agree. Obviously, the creator who is also the author of Scripture, is not going to contradict himself. And so if we find a discrepancy between a scientific theory and biblical interpretation, then one of them are wrong or both of them are wrong. But true science and true biblical interpretation should always harmonize. As far as man, when we come into the book of Genesis, God creates man. And it's made specific that God, man is created in God's image. Now, that does not mean that we look like God physically, because God is a self-existent, pure spirit. Now, we are created in God's image, like something C.S. Lewis said. He said, I don't have a soul, I am a soul, I have a body. The image of God is what's on the inside, that is, we are a created spirit. And in a very limited measure, we share many of God's, some of God's attributes. For example, we have an ascetic side of us. We can appreciate beautiful things and good food. We have a moral side of us. Now, not everyone has the same moral standard, I know. Not everyone draws a line in the same place. But everyone draws a line somewhere. 
Everyone has a moral side of them, and everyone has a religious or spiritual side of them. No, not everyone serves the same religion, but man is incurably and inherently religious, and I think the very fact of all the world religions you've studied bears that out, that everyone serves or worships something at the end of the day. If it's not a deity, it simply may be themselves or pleasure, but everyone worships or serves something. Man is incurably religious. But man is also rational. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it says that God has placed eternity within the heart of man. That is, that's why we're different from the animals. Animals are immersed in time, but we, we can rise above time a little bit. God sees this much, animals see this much, and we might see this much. We think about yesterday, we think about tomorrow, we can contemplate eternity. We know we're going to die. We know we're mortal. And so we can think in a straight line, and we can reason things out. A number of those sorts of attributes, that makes up that image. We are a spirit in a body. That's who we are. Now that helps me. That helps me immensely because as I interact with people, even people that disagree with me, I realize that they have tremendous value. I will never meet someone who is not going to live forever somewhere. I am never going to meet someone who is not going to spend 99.9% .9 of their existence somewhere else. And I'm never going to meet anyone who doesn't need Christ. Everyone has immense value. Jesus said that your soul is worth more than the entire physical universe, Matthew 16. And so I'm going to treat that, 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 them that way. If, if they disagree with me, if they give me flack, I'm still going to be kind and respectful to them because that's a man or woman made in God's image. They have eternal value. They are worth more than every possession I have. And so I'm not going to make the mistake of thinking that things are more valuable than people. People are always more valuable than things. People are more valuable than my career. They're more valuable than my possessions. People are the valuable things here upon earth because when everything is said or done and the universe is destroyed, the only thing left, the only thing left is going to be the souls, is going to be the spirits, is going to be the people. That's all that God is going to get out of this entire physical universe that he has made. People have immense value, so I will be careful about how I talk to people, I will be careful about how I treat people, and I will treat them with honor, and I will treat them with respect as a man or woman made in God's image. Now, man has free will. Man has choice. We even see that, we see that specifically in both Adam and Eve and Cain. God confronts Cain in Genesis 4 when Cain, Cain disobeys, but God says, if you do well, and if you do not do well, man has free will, man has choice. And we see that throughout Scripture. And, and, and so man is, not a, man is not inherently a product of his environment. Environment is a factor. Man is not inherently a product of genetics. That's a factor too. But free will, free will can trump all of that. And, and when you see that, you see that every day. Every time that you see kids come to college and they abandon the religion of their parents, you're seeing free will exercised. In the church where I preached, at least half of the people were not raised by Christian parents. I believe half of our members here did not come from this particular religious background. They came from all different backgrounds or cultures. And so you see free will exercised by people Every, every, every day. Even, even, even you see people exercise free will when environment seems to, like, well, they're just going to go that way, and they don't go that way. They rebel against their environment. They rebel against their upbringing, and, and they go against all their heritage. That's free will, and that trumps everything. Now, why would God make people with free will? Because you're running a risk there. You make mankind with free will because that means... People may abuse their free will. Well, God wants certain attributes, love, patience, kindness, joy, all those attributes out of people. If man's just a robot, then, none of, then man's not going, going to be able to display any of those qualities. God is after quality, not quantity. God did not want mindless robots. 
God wanted free-willed people that would love him of their own choice. Because that, that's the only time that love and all those attributes, mercy and all those wonderful attributes that everyone likes, that's the only time those things mean anything is when they're freely given and not forced. And so if we want people to be moral and ethical and loving and good, then we have to make them free-willed. And so that they will voluntarily give that and say, I, 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 will, I will do that. Of my own choice, I'm going to love God and do the right thing. Now, it is clear that God is a risk taker, a, a good risk taker, not a foolish risk taker. God makes the universe, he makes man free-willed. And God knew, God knew that man was going to abuse that free will because the Bible teaches that Jesus, the plan was that Jesus was going to die for man's sins even before, the, before God created anyone. And you would find that in passages like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Nothing caught God by surprise. God knew that man would rebel. Not necessarily that Adam was singled out to rebel, but God knows at some point people are going to sin. And sin is not a mistake. Sin is not like locking your keys in your car and, and forgetting about things and uh, putting stuff in the fridge that doesn't belong there and, 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 buy and, and that sort of thing, and investing in the wrong stocks. Sin is a violation of God's will. And, and God's will is not a list of arbitrary rules. God's will is an extension of his nature. Romans 3 says, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's glory is who he is, his nature. Um, for example, lying is wrong is because God has got a truth. And lying violates this eternal principle that God tells the truth. Therefore, it's wrong not to tell the truth. Um, God is against people who break their marriage vows, commit adultery, because God keeps his commitments. And so anytime that God says that something is wrong, it's not arbitrary. It's not that God just had to have some rules. Okay, what are they going to be? Rather, those rules are an extension of who he is, his nature. And that list of rules is not an endless list. In fact, there are far more, th far more things you can do than things that you can't do. But... Sin does separate us from God. It, 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 it puts up a wall in the relationship, Isaiah 59. And if we die in that state, if we die separated from God, then we're eternally separated from God. In Genesis chapter 3, we find the fall, Adam and Eve's sin. Now, you might say, well, why couldn't God just kind of give us one rule to keep and that would make it really simple? Well, that's what God did in the garden. There was only one rule, Genesis 2.16. You can eat from every tree in the garden except that one. And, and, and the, the text says you may eat abundantly. And so God says you can eat all you want. There, there's all this stuff. But here's the one rule. You can't eat from that tree. Satan comes along, Satan comes along, and he's going to mess things up. And so he comes along and says, has God said this? And they say, well, here's what God has said. And then Satan says, no, no. If you eat from that tree, you won't die. And Satan gets Adam and Eve focused upon the one thing they can't have. Now, they had a wonderful life. They had paradise. There was complete ease among them. There was no walls in their relationship. End of Genesis says they were both naked and unashamed. There was perfect ease among them. It was a wonderful world. And so... Satan says, there's something here that God's holding out from you. God knows that you'll be like him if you eat from that fruit. You'll know good and evil, and, and, God's, try, and God's not working in your best interest, and God's trying to deprive you, just as Satan does today. Uh, you're not going to have any fun. You're not going to be happy if you're a Christian and things like that. And so that's why Satan comes at Adam and Eve. And they get focused on that tree, and that's all they can look at, and they, they violate God's word, and they sin. And so there's consequences of that. Now Adam's going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. Now there's going to be increased pain in childbirth. And now there's going to be strained relationships be between men and women in marriage. And, and now there's going to be death. There's going to be decay. There's going to be diseases and things like that. And so right there in Genesis, that helps me understand the world I live in. First of all, the suffering of this world is real. It's not an illusion. 
But the suffering is not God's fault because God created a perfect world where everything was good. There was no disease. There was no death. There was no decay. There was no strained relationships. There was no crime. Sin is going to open up the door, and, and that sin spreads to all men. It's not inherited. Okay, you don't inherit sin. You don't inherit sins of your parents. Rather, everyone in the steps of Adam and Eve chooses to sin. Don't get mad at them. If they would not have sinned, I would have. I would, I would have wrecked it for everyone, or you would have. Okay. So don't get mad at them. Don't blame them, because you've sinned too, and so has everybody else. Sin spread to all men, Paul said in Romans 5, 12, because all have sinned. Now, we may not have sinned exactly like Adam and Eve, but we've all violated God's will at some point. We've all hurt other people in what we've said or done. All right, we all fit in that category. But as a result of that, the world that we're now born into contains suffering, death, disease. All right, now, don't, don't blame God for if, if a tsunami comes through and wipes out a village somewhere, don't blame God and says, why did God let that happen? God did not create a world with severe weather. That's all the result of man's transgression. Never say, uh, well, it was God's will that person get cancer. It was not God's will. God, God did not create cancer. That's not God's, something that God made. That is a consequence. Disease is a consequence of us living in a world where there is now sin. So none of that bad stuff is God's will. If you're going to get angry at anyone, first of all, get angry at Satan who, ha who hates you and wants to destroy you. But also, there needs to be some anger focused on you as far as, I can't blame anybody else for this broken world because I have contributed to the brokenness here. I've done my share of sinning. I'm at fault too, so I can't feel sorry for myself, and so I'm not going to blame God. Now, immediately, immediately God goes to provide a solution to man's sin. But you might be thinking, ah, if God knew man was going to sin and, and all that, but as I look around, there are not a whole lot of people that are walking the walk that are being Christians, and so why would God go through all of this? Why would God go through all this? Because it looks like the whole experiment has turned out terrible. Why would God take that risk? Good question. God did not create us because he was lonely. All right? He needed companionship. He already had perfect companionship with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and the angels, and they have great companionship. Heaven's a great place. So he did not need company. Um, Acts 17, Paul's speech there, it says, God does not need anything from us. So there was no deficiency of God. God is a giver. God is the giver of all good things, all blessings, James 1.17. The reason that God creates this world and creates man is because God obviously wants to share his existence with people, that is heaven with people. There's so many great things about being alive. You know, the question was, you rather be born and live in this world or never be born? Would you rather, is it better to love and lose or never loved at all? A question like that. From God's perspective, it is better to be born into a world of suffering and heartache and a lot of good things too, but there's suffering here definitely. And, but with, but with the opportunity at 99.9% of, of your existence being in an absolute paradise with God, having the shot at that, that's worth the risk. Even if most people, as Jesus said, most are on the broad way, even if most people don't jump at that, God says, but you just, you just have to have the, the chance at that. You have to have the shot at it. Now, I'm willing, I'm willing to roll everything on that. I'm willing to risk everything on that to at least give those who want it the opportunity of absolute bliss and wonder. So God is not a place safe God, oh, I'm, I'm worried, I'm worried, you know, so I'm not going to create anyone. No. He says, let her roll. Let's, let's create. We're going to give them free will. And, of course, you know this conversation had to take place before that. God, if you make them a free will, they may abuse their free will. They may sin. Now what are you going to do? You can't sweep those sins under the rug. You're just. Someone has to be punished. And, and you can picture Jesus saying, I'll die for them. I'll die for them. 
So going in, going in, before he even makes one bit of matter, going in, God knows that this creation is going to cost him. And Jesus is also viewed as the creator. John 1, 3, it's going to cost him a lot of emotional pain. And when he takes on a body of flesh, intense physical agony. But he says, do it. Do it. Because the prospect of eternal life is so great that people have to have, people have to have the chance to choose that. So God was not selfish and did not say, I'm going to keep this, all this wonderful existence to myself. I want to share it with other individuals. Concerning truth, it does exist. It is objective. It's not subjective. The Bible warns us about feelings. They are great liars. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. Christianity is not a feeling religion from the standpoint of read the Bible and then pray and then God will send you a feeling whether it's true or not. Mm -mm, that's not the way it operates. Truth is viewed as objective, supported by facts. Truth is revealed in Scripture. Jesus said, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. It has all truth, John 16, 13. The Bible, Old and New Testament, as a collection, claims to be everything that we need, and it is God's word. It's not simply a bunch of concepts. Rather, it is the truth and the exact words to express it. So the Bible is viewed as understandable, written on man's level, having everything we need to make it to heaven, everything we need to please God, being truth, not just some sort of religious truth, but truth, being supported by the facts, and um, being the final, being the final revelation of man, and that God is not speaking today. God has spoken, and he's spoken through his son, the last spokesman, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, and the faith has once for all revealed, Jude 3. So God decided instead of, like, speaking to everyone individually through their feelings or thoughts, God has God selected prophets and apostles, inspired men. He spoke through them. They wrote. Those writings are collected and they're preserved. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And so Jesus said, don't worry about, you're always going to have scripture. You're always going to have the truth. It's not going to be lost. It's not going to be corrupted. It's not going to be mistranslated. You will always have it and it will be available for everyone. And that's what we see today. The Bible is very accessible. All right. Faith is not an emotion, not a mere emotion. Bible faith is not this. I hope there's a good. All right. Faith is based on evidence, according to Scripture. The God often says, don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. I want you searching the Scriptures. I want you testing everything. The Bereans in Acts 17 11 are spoken of as noble-minded because they search the Scriptures to see whether things were so. I want, in Acts chapter 17, I want to throw out one verse here, though. In Acts chapter 17, verse 2, Paul's in a Jewish synagogue. He's spreading the gospel. He's reasoning with them, it says, from the scriptures for three Sabbaths. It says, in verse 3, it says, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer. To me, that's insightful. Here's the way the Bible comes at us. The Bible lays it down and says, here is the evidence. Here is the evidence. So Paul comes into the Jewish synagogue and says, here are the prophecies in the Old Testament that anticipated the Messiah. There are 300 back there. They describe his life and his death and, and how he would die and where he would be buried and things like that and what he would teach. Here's Jesus of Nazareth and here's his life and the, his life matches those prophecies. So faith is not this. Faith is not a leap. It's not a stab in the dark. Bible faith is, God says, look at the evidence, pick up the scriptures and read it, and let the evidence convict you. Do not just do this. Do not just say, well, I'm just going to pray and follow my emotions. No, your emotions are liars. You look at the evidence. Look at the evidence, you examine it, and let the Bible build its case. And so examination is, is stressed. Now, before I kind of go through a Bible overview, what I'd like to do is that, how do I deal, though, in a world today, and it's always been this way, God's people, whether believers in the Old Testament or believers in the New Testament, Christians, have always lived in a pluralistic world. Has, uh, Israel lived in a world surrounded by 
There, there was the Baals, there was idolatry, there was all sorts of stuff. When they were in Egypt, they were surrounded by Egyptian worship and Egyptian religions. When they were in the land of Canaan, they were surrounded by the Canaanites and things like that. God's people have always lived in a pluralistic society where there are a lot of other beliefs out there. Okay, as a Christian, how do I handle that? I like Paul's answer. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's in, it starts in verse 10. Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to be the judge, and we're going to have to answer for the things that we did in the body, whether good or bad, all right? And so I know I'm going to meet up with Jesus at the judgment day, and not only am I going to be there, but everybody else, all, are going to be there too. That's, that's the way a Christian looks at it. All right, so how does, that ch how does that change the way I live? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to answer for what I did. I can't blame anybody for my life. I can't blame my parents or this person or that person. I'm going to answer for what I did. And, and, and I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be there and, and say, well, I was planning on doing that. No, it's what you did. Good intentions do not count. It's what you did, good or bad. It's what you did. And so I'm not going to, and so I'm not going to blame anybody else for my life. That, that's one way it helps me. I'm not going to feel far, sorry for myself. I'm accountable for me, what I believe and what I do. No one forces me to do anything or believe anything. And so at the end of the day, the buck stops here. And so I, I am not, I'm not answering for my parents' transgressions, and, and I can't ride their to coattails into heaven either. All right. Verse 11 says, Therefore, based on the fact we're going to be before the judgment of Christ, knowing the fear of the Lord or taking God seriously, knowing that we're going to be judged, and we're only given one lifetime, Hebrews 9, 28. We, we're not given multiple lifetimes. We only live once. And after that is death and the judgment. And, and there are no second chances after we die, or there are no second chances after Jesus shows up. And so this is our one shot. There's, so there's some urgency about this life. So he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we, what do we do with it? We persuade men. All right. Since I know we are all, everyone who ever lives is going to stand before Christ and answer to Him. Therefore, I'm going to try to tell people, hey, <laughs> hey, you need to know like, about Christ. So do not be offended. Do not, do not be offended when I come up and try to persuade you about Christianity or try to convert you. Everyone's trying to convert you. You need to understand that. Everyone's trying to sell you something. You turn on the radio, you're on the internet, everyone is trying to persuade you. Christ, the Christian religion is not the only one out there trying to convert people. Every group is trying to convert people, all right? So don't, don't, don't say, ah, you're trying to convert me. Well, everybody is. You're trying to persuade me of things, I'm trying to persuade you of everything. Everyone is trying to convert everyone about something, all right? So, do not be offended when I come up and try to convert you because... Trying to, trying to persuade you says, I care about you. If I didn't care about you, I got a lot of other things to do besides sharing Christ with you. That's time consuming, okay? I could be doing a hobby or whatever, but since I know that I'm going to appear before Christ with everybody else, and he's the judge, and he's the, way, he's the only way to the Father, therefore, I want you to know about that. I think you need to be pre-warned. Like, if I had the cure for cancer, if I kept it to myself, man, would I be a selfish person. Well, I know the way. Jesus is the way. I know what you need to be saved. I know how you need to live. Well, man, I, I need to share that with people. And so do not be offended if I try to convert you. And, and that's what I'm trying to do, <laughs> all right? That's what I'm trying to do. I, I, don't, I, don't like, I don't like fake type evangelism where someone comes up and says, hey, how you doing? And... Uh, and uh, I know people have come up and tried to do that to me, and I found out they're trying to sell me Amway or get me involved in some multi-level marketing scheme. Right off the bat, I want to know I'm trying to persuade you about Christ. Because I believe, as Paul believed, that everyone needs to be a Christian. He is the way to Father. He is the Savior. He's the Messiah. And I think he backed it up with his claims and his miracles and all the evidence backs up. He's God's son. He's the only one who has an empty tomb. All right. Um, so I am seeking to... Persuade you. Then Paul says this, that in verse 16, Therefore, from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh. That is, here's how Christianity changes my out, uh, perspective of people. Well, first of all, 
I need to share Christ with everyone because I love everyone and I'm concerned about everyone and I don't want people to end up there unprepared and I don't want to end up at the judgment with my friend and my, and my friend is unprepared and my friend look at me and say, well, why didn't you ever tell me about this? You knew. Why didn't you tell me? Some friend you turned out to be. So when someone tries to persuade you about Christ, they love you, they're being kind, they realize you're going to be there with everybody else and they don't want you to be unprepared. At least you got to be, at least you deserve, you deserve the information. Okay. Then it says, we recognize no man according to flesh. What that means is that I look at everybody as a soul or a spirit. And so I don't care how much money you make. I don't care what job you have, or what house you live in. That doesn't matter to me. Uh, it, it, Christianity is not a caste system. Everyone before God is equal. The ground at the cross is equal. We are all sinners. We all need salvation. We all have eternal value to God. God does not want any to perish, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And so you're all equal. Thomas Jefferson got it right. We are all equal before God. And so if you're a waitress, I'm not going to look down on you or, 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 or you're, you're at Olive Garden or whatever. I'm going to say, you know, you got value. Thanks for waiting on me. Uh, your soul is worth more than the entire world. You have eternal value. You may be working a minimum wage job, doesn't matter to me. You have value. And so I don't view people anymore as far as what they look like on the outside, what they, the, the nice clothes or whatever they have. Everyone I run into it has, is a soul. And everyone I run into needs Christ. And everyone I run into needs to be treated with respect and honor. And that includes like if I'm a young man, then the way I'm going to look at a young lady is, that she has a soul. She's not just a body. She is not there for my gratification. She does not exist just for me to oogle at her. And she has a mother and father. And she is someone's sister, probably. And so I'm going to treat her with honor and respect when I date her. And I'm not going to just use her as, I'm not just going to use her. And so when I run into people that disagree with me or, or uh, another faith, I will say, well, let's sit down and study. I mean, I mean, this is, this is the most important thing, right? I mean, we're going to spend 99.9% .9 of our existence somewhere. At least we should take the time now and find out what the truth is. So give me your arguments, and I'll give you mine, and we will look at the evidence. Because Christianity is not based on emotion. It's based on the evidence. Faith is based on evidence and being convicted by the evidence. All right. Now let's do a little bit of historical overview. You got creation. You got the fall. It, all the Old Testament events are backed up by Jesus and the apostles. Jesus talks about creation, talks about Adam and Eve. They talk about the fall. They talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. They talk about the flood. All those big miraculous events in the Old Testament, the New Testament views them as historical realities and as actually happening that way. The flood comes because man is so evil and God is trying to preserve the human race. We come up to the point of time of Abraham. God selects Abraham. God gives three promises to Abraham. And those two of the promises are followed in the Old Testament. You're going to be a great nation. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He has 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. Then Abraham has promised land. I'm giving you the land of Canaan. Okay? And that's fulfilled in the book of Joshua. The rest of the Old Testament involves God interacting with the nation of Israel. He gives them the law, the Ten Commandments, and a lot of other laws went with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are kind of like the Bill of Rights. All the other laws plug in somewhere to the Ten Commandments. And that law is to protect them. It's to protect them be, from being assimilated by other cultures. It's to protect them from going off into false religion and idolatry. And it is to keep the nation of Israel intact and protected until the Messiah comes. Because the Messiah is going to come through Abraham, through his lineage, through David, and be born one day. And so we've got to have a Jewish nation if the Messiah is going to come. And the way we're going to protect that nation is we're going to put a fence around the nation like a law. And we're going to protect them from all the bad influences there. And the rest of the Old Testament is God seeking to protect them. Now, sometimes God will punish them, and He will send them up into captivity and say, Have you learned your lesson? He will bring them back seven years later. He will send all sorts of prophets to them. 
But that's basically the history of the Old Testament, God working with Israel. There's a third promise, though, that God gives to Abraham, and that is the promise in your seed, Genesis 12, 3, all the nations will be blessed. That's the Christ. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus. Jesus would come and he would die for all mankind. And he would create, he would create the church. And the church is kind of like the new society. The church is the body of his followers. The church is also called the kingdom of God. It is that God rules over everyone, but the people in the church are people that are submitting to God's rule and acting like it. Church is not a building, not a hierarchy, not some sort of man-made organization. It is the body of the saved. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells you the life of Christ, what Jesus did, what he said, and it also contains the proofs of who he is. Matthew, for example, points out that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He was born of a virgin, that's what Isaiah said, Matthew 1. He was born in Bethlehem, that's what Micah said, Micah 5. He went down in Egypt, that's what Hosea said, Hosea chapter 13. Uh, his hands and his feet were pierced, Psalm 22. He was buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53. Over and over and over and over, Matthew will say, this happened, this, this, this was done or said to fulfill this passage. John the Baptist, Isaiah 40, the forerunner. All right. So Jesus is the object of Old Testament prophecy. He is the Old Testament Messiah predicted hundreds and thousands of years before he was born, and his life matches all those Old Testament prophecies. John would say in John chapter 20, 30 and 31, a lot of other miracles Jesus did, but these are recorded so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ. That is, I'm giving you evidence to convict you that he is God's son and that he is the Messiah. The Gospels are also historical. Luke says, other people put together accounts, I went, I researched everything accurately that you may know the exact truth about what you believed. Now, the book of Acts is the sequel. The book of Acts is what happened after Jesus left? What happened after he ascended in heaven? What happened after the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles? Ah, book of Acts is the spread of Christianity, the establishment of the church, and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire and various churches, local congregations being established. The epistles that follow, Romans, etc., that follow, are letters to many of the churches established on Paul's journeys in the book of Acts. Paul comes to Corinth, the church is started there. Ah, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Paul preaches in Galatian territory, now Asia Minor, or excuse me, then in Asia Minor, now modern Turkey, thus a letter to the Galatians. Paul comes to Ephesus. And he starts a congregation there. Oh, we got a letter that comes back to the Ephesians. And then we have a number of general letters, like the individuals, like Timothy and Titus and Philemon, a letter to Jewish Christian he Hebrews, a letter to Christians in general in 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and a letter to the seven churches of Asia, the book of Revelation, to help them survive Roman persecution and with the hope of eternal life. All right. The, the Gospels, the life of Christ, the epistles, are letters back to churches, and here's what Christians believe, and here, here's how Christians are to live. So you got doctrine and practical application, many of the letters. All right. Now, why did Jesus have to die? I want to deal with that. First of all, the Bible says that soul, the soul that sins, it shall die. We don't inherit any sins, but the soul that sins, it will, die. it will die. So sin must be punished. Sin is evil. And God is a God of justice. God cannot pretend that he didn't see sin happen. God cannot just take sin and sweep it under the rug. All right? So, the soul that sins, it will die. That is, sin must be punished. That's justice. We, 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 we don't like judges who someone does something and they just let them off the hook. We say, hey, hey, what happened to justice here, right? You, you do the crime, you do the time. All right, we understand that. We have a sense of justice too. At the same time, though, God wants to be merciful. God, does not, God has no pleasure in the death of the sinner, Ezekiel 18. 
God doesn't want to see anyone perish. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. All right. But animal sacrifices can't deal with sins. God had them sacrifice animals because that all looked up to the sacrifice of Christ. That was all, that was all trying to tell the Jewish people, hey, 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 these sacrifices have to be made every year. Obviously, these sins are not being dealt with. We need a bigger sacrifice. But neither can we do, do some good works or good deeds to make up. That is, if I lie, I can't say, well, I will help an old lady across the street. And those two things will balance out. No, that's not the way it works. For example, if I run a red light, I can't tell the policeman, but I've been stopping at that same red light for five years. All the times that I stopped at the light do not make up for the one time I violated it. That's the way sin works. When I tell a lie, all the times that I'm honest does not make up for that lie because I should have been honest then too. Luke 17, 10, Jesus said, when you've done everything that is commanded of you, say we're unprofitable servants, we've only done what we should have done. That's why good deeds do not make up for sins. That means you, you can't work off your sins, you can't do extra credit, you can't say, yeah, I sinned over there, but how, how about if I substitute all these good deeds for that sin, want to cancel it out? No, because you should have been doing all those good deeds anyway. You're always short when you come to sin. It never makes it up because you should have been living right anyway all the time. And the one time that you did not live right, that's a strike against you. And you cannot balance it out with good deeds. The only way that you can be delivered from your sins is you have to be just forgiven of it. But the only way that God can forgive anyone is someone has to pay the price of those sins. And that's why Jesus is upon the cross. And that's the only way it could have been done. I could not have died for you because I have my own sins. The only person that could have died for us is God in a human body, and that's who is upon the cross. Only the life of God is a moral equivalent to our evil deeds. That should tell you how bad sins are. When Jesus was in the garden, he said, Father, if there's any other way this can be removed this cup, the cup was not removed, therefore, that's the only way. If, if man's going to be saved, if man's going to be forgiven, the only way to be forgiven then is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so salvation is unmerited, it's undeserved. The Bible calls that grace, but it is conditional. Jesus died upon the cross, but that does not mean that everyone is automatically forgiven. Salvation is a gift, but you have to receive it. And the aspects of receiving it are that you have to hear the gospel, you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You have to repent, turn from your sins. You can't, you can't be doing sins and forgiven of them at the same time. You can't, be, you can't be living in adultery and forgiven of adultery. You, stir, you first have to stop the sinful practice. So you have to be sorry about the things you've done. You have to be willing to stop it, cease to practice, and turn in the opposite direction. That's repentance. You have to confess Christ before men, and you have to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And then at that point, you're a Christian, and you're saved, and you're forgiven. But that's the beginning. From then on, you have to live faithful to God thereafter. That is, you have to live faithful to God. You will still sin, but when you sin, you have to own up to God. It says, God, I did that. It's wrong. And ask His forgiveness, and then you go on. All right? You have to be honest. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be honest. All right. Now... A couple other things here as I close is, again, the church. The church is the body of the saved. You are added to the church through, by, at baptism. When you're baptized, Jesus adds you to his church. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, verse 47. It's a new society. It's made up of people from all different cultures. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles and black and white and everybody else and slaves and free and men and women. And... It is the place where mankind can truly find unity. All of us who came from different backgrounds can all find unity within that one body. Jesus is a universal savior, and he said, go out and preach the gospel to all men. Um, morals matter because what you do with your body matters. Your body is consequential. People are hurt when we sin. Sin matters. And we need to honor God in our body. And so we need to live for him. 
We don't need to live for ourselves. All right. How, do, how does this all change me? What impact does it, this, this have upon me? Well, first of all, if, if I only have one lifetime, then there's urgency of how I treat people now because I can't come back up and make up for it. And so there's urgency of living right now, and there's urgency of sharing the gospel with people right now, and there's urgency of changing my life right now. I can't say, well, one of these days I'm going to get around to it. No. And there's also urgency in things like making my marriage happy, making it work now, because I only get one marriage. Not only that, but everything matters. Everything I say matters. I'm going to be judged by how I live. I'm going to be judged for what I say. And so I can't say, well, I'm just going to swear at them because they're just nobody. I can't do that. They matter, and I'm going to answer for every word I said, Jesus said in John chapter 12, 36. So it's not that nothing matters. It's everything I do every day matters. Everything I say matters. How I treat people matters. How I treat anyone matters. Everything matters. How I use my time matters. And suffering is real. And it's here because of sin and my sins too. And everybody out there has a soul. And I'm going to spend 99.9% .9 of my existence somewhere else other than this life. Therefore, material things are not the end all. And I'm going to meet God in judgment. And that could happen at any time. And therefore, I need to walk the walk. I know you'd be saying, well, I know a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, I hate hypocrites too. So does God. My answer to people says, well, I'm not going to church. I'm going to be a Christian because a lot of Christians are hypocrites. You're right. A lot of people who profess Christ are hypocrites. You're exactly right. But not everybody. But tell you what, God says he's going to send the hypocrites to hell. And if you really don't want to be with the hypocrites, then live right. All right. That's kind of my presentation. That's my presentation. And when I kind of look at it, it's, here's the way I'd look at it. Um, there either is a God or isn't one. All right? And I think everything points to a God. Now, God is either impersonal or personal. And I think God is personal. All right. Now, God has spoken. I, to me, the logical thing, if there's a God, then God would communicate with us. Why create man if you wouldn't communicate with him? So God has spoken. Where is that communication found? There's only so many books that claim to be God's word. The Bible is one of them. Look at the Quran. You got the Bible. You got other scriptures. Okay, pull them out. Compare them. Which one do you think has the earmarks or the evidences of being a book from God? A book from God would be historical, tr historically true, scientifically accurate. Maybe have some scientific foreknowledge in it, like the Earth is round and stuff like that. Bible has that. Isaiah 42, 40 verse 22. It would have the highest moral standard known to man. It would have the best teachings known. All right. It, it, would, it would present the world as it really is. And I think the Bible does that. As far as Jesus, is he Lord, liar, or a lunatic? Which one is he? All right. Whether Jesus was raised from the dead, what happened to his body? I think the evidence is the tomb was empty on the first day of the week. And, and I don't see the Romans taking the body. I don't see the Jews taking the body. I don't see the disciples taking the body. The body's guarded. All the enemies of Christ want the body left in the tomb, but on the first day of the week, the body's not there. What happened to the body? I think you have to deal with that. And is Jesus the Son of God? He worked the miracles. I think he gave the teachings. Um, and he's the only one. He's the only religious founder whose tomb is empty. My advice to you is, who's the Savior? Who's the one who I should be listening to? Listen to the one who was raised from the dead. Thank you. Hey, you got any questions? You got any questions? You can always give me a call, 503-644-9017. I do have a website, uh, beavertonchurchofchrist.net. There's an email link there, and that email link goes directly to me. And uh, hey, any questions you want to fire me, I'm here. I got a young man I'm training to preach to. We got members here. Uh, Bible. We will. We'll try to give you a Bible answer for a Bible question. Uh, we we look forward to investigation and and communication. And uh, hey, let's find what the truth is because we're not going to live forever. And we're going to have to. We're going to have to face eternity. And so, I just want to be right. So uh, I will seek to co convince you. You convince me. I just want to know what the truth is. Thank you.